it is in fact a fault zone and this fault zone uh, is almost two states wide all of california and half of nevada nevada's crust is cracked and broken by thousands of faults each one a potential earthquake waiting to strike we consider a fault active if it had an earthquake in the last million years or so knowing where these faults are is very important because this tells us where the location of future earthquakes might be and we just produced this map last year uh, showing all the quaternary faults that is faults that have moved in the last 1.8 million years or younger there's tens of thousands of faults on this map um, and any of these could be a candidate for a future earthquake the faults exist across the state one side to the other the top to the bottom uh, but we do have a particular concentration of faults in the western part of the state where the mogul sequence occurred but when they zero in on the area directly beneath Reno's suburbs, the maps show no known faults where the earthquakes are striking. Without a previously mapped fault to point to, geologists are left without an obvious culprit behind the steadily increasing swarm. But it also gives scientists hope that Reno may yet escape disaster. The fact that there was no known fault in a way was an encouragement because largest earthquakes happen on the largest faults. When a fault in the Earth slips, the size of the earthquake that results is determined by three main factors. One is how long the fault is. Another is, is how deep the fault penetrates into the Earth. And the third is, is how far the fault slips during the earthquake. So if the slip is very short, um, you could have a 100 kilometer long fault that slips only a centimeter, and that would be a relatively small earthquake. But if it slipped 10 meters, then that would be a large earthquake. Uh, so the, the size of the earthquake scales with the amount of slip that occurs. With no fault at all, then we don't expect it to mature into something genuinely large and seriously damaging. But maps of the geologic fault pattern are in constant flux as the Earth changes. The swarm may be caused by an old dormant fault that has gone undetected until now, or perhaps by something else entirely. It's possible that this earthquake is related to a brand new fault uh, that we haven't mapped before. As March turns into April and the earthquakes persist, Reno's residents and scientists nervously watch and wait. But as they pray for the quakes to die down, the swarm is just getting ready to unleash its full fury on Reno. By the middle of April 2008, a steady stream of earthquakes has been threatening families in Reno's usually quiet suburbs for almost two months. There have been 14 small earthquakes in this area since April 1st. And while that's not unusual, what is a little bit strange is that we've been feeling so many of them. Some quakes shake longer, others shake harder, but the rumbling beneath homes persists. And what was of concern was that people become numb to the threat after a period of time because it started to become almost a routine in their lives. But on April 15th, the swarm drastically breaks from its routine. April 15th, the, the swarm changed character. We began the morning with a magnitude three that caught our attention. Later that same afternoon, three more quakes, all in the magnitude three range, strike within only seven minutes of each other. This is another way to look at the data, and this is a this is in 24-hour blocks, and each one of these lines is, is is one hour's worth of data. This is the activity on the 14th. Things appear almost to be getting quieter, although we're still having a number of small earthquakes. But the following day, this is the first magnitude three early in the morning. And here's a succession of three magnitude three earthquakes later in the afternoon. Scientists believe this escalation may be a warning that the swarm is evolving into something more dangerous. So we clearly we're picking up the activity here. This is the signal that things have changed. We didn't like changes. Changes were bad. I definitely had a pretty good feeling of dread when the three threes came through in, in pretty rapid succession there. In just a single day, the swarm releases as much energy as it has in all of the previous six weeks combined. We began to pour over data, any kind of data. And I think if you look at the graphs, you can see that it's as if a runaway sequence was trying to get going. The story changes dramatically, and you can see immediately this rate that rate are different. Plainly, it's accelerating 
we're talking most of 50 earthquakes here in a day, or to an hour. This is different behavior than we've seen before, and really unprecedented. Scientists are concerned that the swarm is gearing itself up to unleash even larger quakes. At that point, I felt strongly motivated to communicate that to the emergency responders and called emergency management. And I remember how I began the conversation. I just said, I don't know what to say. <laughs> because we had no protocol whatsoever for calling an emergency manager and communicating that this could look like a foreshock sequence and we may have to be prepared for something larger. Reno's emergency responders must determine how to quickly prepare a city of more than 200,000 people for a potential catastrophe. We had to strike a balance between uh, preparing people, uh, but without alarming them unnecessarily. Have your emergency kit ready uh, should you need to move out of your house or live for several days without power. We're trying to coordinate with emergency management people as well as the television. The governor and emergency officials are also expected to emphasize the importance of individual homeowner preparedness. Trying to um, organize press conferences because we've never done this before as a city to prepare people for a potentially large earthquake. The four stronger quakes of April 15th mark the start of a dramatic second phase in the swarm's pattern. Quakes that had been striking roughly every three days now start attacking roughly three times each day. April 15, 16, 17, 18, 19, and for a while you expect that. You expect after a magnitude threes, we're going to have aftershocks of magnitude two with one class. And so what you hope is that by, you know, 18th to 20th, 22nd, you'd, you'd really like to see it taper off. In our case, it didn't. So that means we're still heading up, <laughs> right? We're still increasing in magnitude over time. We have no idea what's going to happen. I mean, we don't know whether this is it or not. As Reno is pounded by more quakes each day, Residents fear their biggest little city in the world is about to turn into a disaster zone. Months of sustained tension begin taking their toll on the community. There were examples of people that left, and there were examples of people that actually put their homes up for sale. We did have a large uh, percentage of guests at a couple of our major hotels check out and decide to end their vacation you know, because of the earthquakes. Those residents and tourists who stay continue being tormented daily by numerous magnitude two and larger earthquakes. Although the damage is minimal, rumors start to fly of Reno's impending apocalypse. There was a strong rumor beginning that they could be volcanic in nature. Swarms are really common in areas of volcanic activity. For example, you have swarms of earthquakes in Hawaii, Yellowstone comes to mind. Nearby Yellowstone National Park in Wyoming sits above a supervolcano that blows its top approximately every 600,000 years. With molten rock or magma constantly churning underground, it's a hotbed of earthquake swarm activity. Thousands of quakes strike Yellowstone each year. And the public is, is aware swarms are associated with volcanism, and there was a lot of questions early on about, uh, well, is this a volcanic swarm? Some residents know that Reno's landscape is littered with volcanic rock. Lo and behold, if you look around in places, there are some volcanic flows at the surface. They're 10 million years old, but they are there. But scientists know that Reno's volcanic history is the ancient past. They dismiss an underground volcano as a possible explanation for Reno's troubles. There's no reason to suppose any of that's going on in the Mogul area. We recognize volcanic areas, and Mogul isn't one of them. And plus, none of this is deep. Volcanic earthquakes tend to originate deeper in the Earth as magma pushes its way up through the crust to the surface. This sequence started shallow and stayed shallow, so there was nothing really below six or seven kilometers to suggest that it was connected to some kind of volcanic system at depth. With a volcano ruled out, scientists looked to other known causes of swarms for clues. There was some concern that these earthquakes could be man-made. 
There can be swarms associated with groundwater withdrawal at times. The pumping of groundwater for irrigation can lower an area's water table, creating a void in the earth that causes the ground to shift. But those conditions didn't exist in, in Mogul. We didn't have any deep wells that were going a half mile or deeper that could be uh, influencing these earthquakes. Introducing water into the earth's crust can also help an earthquake along. There have been seismic swarms caused in other parts of the world by people injecting water deep into the earth. In the earth, there's a lot of pressure. And it's holding these faults together. Uh, that's a normal stress that's, that's actually preventing a fault from slipping. Um, if you inject fluids into these cracks, they can somehow lubricate a fault plane and cause an earthquake to occur. Water injection is often connected to mining and drilling, but scientists know of no recent mining projects in Reno suburbs. So out the door, none of the things that cause earthquake swarms really fit the description. Alarmed residents grow impatient to learn when the attack on their towns will finally end. What's going on? How large will this get? Uh, do we need to start evacuating schools? Should we be closing? There's a lot of people that expected us to know what was going to be the next earthquake. That we prepared for earthquakes, you can watch a special program that will air periodically. Those preparations will soon prove invaluable. The swarm is about to let loose its biggest attack on Reno yet. By the middle of April 2008, citizens of Reno, Nevada are desperate to know if the big one is about to strike their city. After months of earthquakes and with the swarm now intensifying, each additional quake has the potential to incite panic. The 911 system in our, in our country is a great concept. Unfortunately, in disasters, that works against us because everyone's first reaction is to pick up the telephone and dial 911. So immediately, the phones started lighting up. Reno 911, any first fire? No. Reno 911. You know, this is something suspicious because quake. People either wanted to report that they felt the earthquake, asking the dispatchers, did you just feel the earthquake? Yeah, we did, we did have a large earthquake. Oh, oh, should we go someplace? Or, uh, where is it safe? And the concern is that people that are having a real life safety issue, their call won't go through uh, because people are trying to report the earthquake. As public safety officials struggle to keep citizens informed and calm, the assault on Reno continues to escalate. It's clear that this thing is not backing off. And this is a very dangerous state of affairs. It's ramping up to something. Scientists scramble to determine precisely where and how the ground in Reno is changing before the big one hits. A team of scientists hikes deep into Nevada's hills. They hope that advanced technology in outer space can help them understand what's happening miles underground on Earth. What we have here is a GPS receiver, it's the Global Positioning System. And it's very similar to the same GPS that many people have in their cars or could go on hikes with now. GPS is essentially a satellite system. There's a constellation of satellites spinning around the Earth, about 24 satellites. Essentially, the GPS satellites send a signal uh, which tells this receiver where the satellite was and when the signal was sent. Uh, and this receiver uses that information to infer the distance to the satellite. So during an earthquake, um, the ground can change its position uh, very subtly. And this, this motion of the ground